Today, I've got a great show for you. We're gonna be talking about the gut, the GI tract. So many of you struggle with gastrointestinal disease. Go to your doctor, you're now being medicated. Maybe it's heartburn, maybe it's constipation, maybe it's inflammatory bowel disease. Any, any way you slice that, the solution medically typically is different prescription drugs or over-the-counter remedies, many of which don't work and actually can create harm. That's what we're gonna be diving into tonight. We're also gonna be talking about some of the solutions, so stay with me. But before we get into that, I wanna give you a little mini crash course on the importance of your gut, what I like to call gut function 101. So let's dive into what your gut does, the, the overarching view. So let's start with your sense of smell. And a lot of people don't consider the nose part of the GI tract, but your sense of smell primes the gut to help you digest your food. It sends chemical messages to your brain and to your gut to start turning on digestive mechanisms. Once you smell something, your mouth starts to water, your stomach starts to rev up the cells that help make acid and pepsin or pepsinogen, these digestive enzymes. It also warns us about potential dangers in food. Remember, smell sends cues or feedback to the brain about things that might not smell quite right that we might not want to eat. So smell plays a role in gut function and digestion, a very, very important one. We also have taste. Taste helps you to identify potential toxins in your food and therefore you know, helps you make better decisions about what you're, gonna, what you're actually gonna swallow. And next, we have the mouth. When food hits your mouth, your salivary glands secrete chemicals to aid in digestion. These very glands produce a chemical called amylase, which is a digestive enzyme that begins the breakdown of carbohydrates as you're eating. In your saliva, you also have a protective antibody called secretory IgA. This is like a handcuff. It binds onto bad guys that might be in your food. Remember, food is not always benign. Sometimes there's viruses or bacteria or other things in it that your immune system protects you from. So the mouth produces an IgA that can give you that protection. Yeah, and of course, also attached to your mouth is your sense of taste. Um, you've got taste buds, uh, particularly on your tongue. These taste buds give you feedback about uh, potential toxins in food and, or whether or not you're gonna swallow that food. So taste is a, is a cue, so to speak, that helps us negate or spit out things that might not be so healthy for us. And then next, we have chewing, which is, again, this is, we're still in the mouth, but you know, obviously the teeth, the mechanical breakdown of food, so the healthier your teeth, the better you can chew, the better you can mechanically break down your food, the better off you're gonna be when it comes to relying on the stomach and the, and the small intestine, which have digestive enzymes to break that food down. So the better you can chew your food, the more capable you're going to be of breaking it down further enzymatically as you go through the GI tract. So this is why thoroughly chewing food will allow easier swallowing and improved digestion. Now once we're done with the mouth, you know, the taste, the chewing, all these things, we're gonna go into the stomach. So we're passing down into the stomach where most of our protein digestion occurs via the en enzyme pepsin, as well as also with hydrochloric acid, the acid that we produce in the stomach. Now, churning and mechanical digestion can also take place in the stomach. So there's a muscular contraction in the stomach itself that also helps in, the, in a mechanical type of digestion. And then the acid in the stomach is also important to help destroy potential microbial invaders. Remember, we can eat things in our food that don't necessarily belong in our body. The job or one of the jobs of the stomach through that act action of acid is to destroy some of these microbial invaders so they don't make it further down into the intestine and eventually colonize our body. Now, once we're done in the stomach, we push on into the small intestine. This is where the greatest, or the, this is where the greatest amount of nutritional absorption occurs uh, is in that small intestine. The other key with the small intestine, very important, is that it houses 70 to 80% of your entire immune system. This is known as the GALT, the gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. That chunk of immune power is designed to help protect you from things that might leak across your gut and try to make it into your bloodstream. So the small intestine, very, very important organ. We don't want it to be damaged. From the small intestine, we go over here to the large intestine, and much of our microbiome, meaning the bacteria, the healthy, friendly flora, lives 
here. It resides in the large intestine. These bacteria help us digest our food, but also these bacteria send regulatory messages to the immune system. So, you know, part of this communication, all right, is the good bacteria talk to the immune system, the immune system talks back. There's a name for that, it's called immune crosstalk. And so this is why it's so important to have a good, healthy flora. We need that bacteria to communicate to our immune system to keep us healthy. Now also in the large intestine, our water balance is regulated. We also produce something called a short chain fatty acid. These are substrates or substances that help fuel the cells of the colon. The colon cells use short chain fatty acids as an energy source so that they can make new cells and keep the gut sealed. If you don't have adequate short chain fatty acids, you can get leaky gut. You can get a breakdown of the intestinal lining. A deficiency of these are also linked to certain types of colon cancer. So again, this short chain fatty acid produced in the colon, very important. It's also important to know that it is the microbes that produce short chain fatty acids. So these microbes are responsible for generating short chain fatty acids. When you eat fiber, your microbes take that fiber and they poop out short chain fatty acids as a fuel source for your colon cells. Again, your large intestine, very, very important part of your gut function. Now we have some accessory organs as well. These are organs that are not attached directly to the inside of the intestine. Remember your intestine as a whole from your mouth to your anus is skin that's folded inward, right? So it's a tube of skin folded inward, but the accessory organs, one of them being your pancreas, although not part directly part of your intestines or your GI tract, is very important for its function. And so one of the things the pancreas produces is a substance called bicarbonate. Now this is a neutralizing agent. It neutralizes the stomach acid. Otherwise, we'd have a heck of a problem when the stomach drops its acid and all its food bolus into the small intestine. The pancreas basically precedes this by putting bicarbonate, a neutralizing agent, down first so that when that stomach bolus drops into the intestine, you're not burning a hole in your intestinal lining. Now, the pancreas also secretes enzymes, amylase and lipase and lactase. These are enzymes that help you digest your food. The pancreas is also important. Not, uh, not, this is not so much for digestion as much as it is for energy production, but it makes insulin. And insulin helps us to regulate blood sugar so that by the time we're done digesting our food and we've pushed that glucose into the bloodstream, the insulin helps that glucose make it into the cell where we can generate energy. Next, we have the gallbladder and the liver, both, again, accessory organs to the GI tract. The liver primarily functions as a detoxification unit. And so most people are aware the liver detoxifies the chemical garbage in our bodies. And sometimes that chemical garbage makes it across the GI tract and hits the liver. So the liver's got to be there to protect us. Now, the liver also produces bile. Bile is a very important salt, acid salt, that is necessary to aid in fat absorption. And the liver also helps regulate blood sugar, helps the pancreas do that. Now, talking about bile here, these bile salts are stored in the gallbladder. So whereas the liver makes them, the gallbladder stores them. Now, this is why a lot of people will have their gallbladders removed and the doctor will say, you don't really need your gallbladder. Uh, because your liver is still going to be able to produce that bile and you're still going to be able to get bile to your intestine. It's just that you won't have the organ that times that bile release. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why the gallbladder is so important. There are hormonal signals that it will receive where it will know when to secrete that bile when a fatty bolus of food is coming through so that you can aid in the absorption of that fat. This process called emulsification is where bile wraps around things that are fat soluble and converts them into water soluble compounds so that your small intestine can then absorb that as opposed to not being able to. So that concludes gut function 101. Just a short little tutorial. Next you want, might want to check out my video on drugs that will impact your gut function in a negative way.